Hey, it's Thursday, April 4th, 2013. Welcome to another Galactic Netcast. This is the Alien Invasion number 64 from Waterloo, Iowa. I'm Dave Kleenex Nelson, and here from Wausau, Wisconsin, it's Brad Puffs plus Ludwig and Anessa Dam. Damn you for being sick, Moyens, from Denton, Texas. <laughs> He's got the tissues. That's and awesome. Brad, Brad is actually holding a box of tissues. Are they Puffs Plus, Brad? No, they are Walmart Great Values brand. Hey, I have those too. Someplace. I actually don't know what kind of tissues I have. I think they're Kleenex. So when you say Kleenex, you actually have a Kleenex, the real brand of Kleenex. I believe that's what I bought. <laughs> I just like reached over and grabbed a box, and I think they were Kleenex brand tissues with lotion. Because remember, they're actually facial tissues. Kleenex, just like the Band-Aid, cleaned up. Yes. They've been stuck into our brains. They've been branded so well that that's the name that they're stuck with. That's they're not the facial name. tissues. No, no. They're Kleenex. They're Kleenex. Grab the Kleenexes. Yes, it has lotion, so my nose Grab a couple be all tree raw. Kleenex there, or no? Yeah. <laughs> all right, so uh, yeah, Anessa's sick. That's why we're talking about this, and uh, we're also going to talk about aliens. This is the podcast. Really? Yeah. Oh my gosh! When talking did we start that? I, I don't know. A uh, couple <laughs> years ago, a year and a half. I, don't, I forget. It. Uh, this is the show where we talk about beings from elsewhere in the universe and/or galaxy. Well, actually. The galaxies within the universe, so it would be the universe, right? The, we're talking about scope, though. The entire yeah. universe or a galaxy, solar yeah. system, are we just galaxy specific? planet. Yeah, are, are we? Yeah, are we? Uh, no, I don't think we are galaxy specific if we've got aliens coming from other dimensions. Wormholes and coming. Yeah. So I mean, oh. they could come, I guess, through a wormhole from the other end of the Milky Way, but. Yeah, on, on Star Trek, there was the well. Those weren't ga those weren't galaxies. Those were uh, like sectors, stars. quadrant, quadrant. Quadrants. You had yeah, uh, yeah. the Delta Quadrant, the Gamma Quadrant, the uh, and they were Alpha, right, Brad? The the main yeah of the uh -huh. generation. Okay. So I don't know. Right. Like, All right. I, I just in the universe. Okay, so this is the podcast where we talk about uh, aliens from elsewhere in the uh, the galaxy and the universe, and their appearances in film, TV, video games, comic books, science, and real life. Uh, this show is divided into three parts. The news, the creature feature. That's our spotlight of a certain kind of alien. And our picks for the week. For our audio subscribers, if you'd like to see us record the show live, uh, we're usually doing it at galacticnetcasts.com slash live at around 8 p.m. Central Time on Thursday nights. We were a little bit late this week, uh, even though I I posted it to Facebook, Google Plus, and Twitter about 45 minutes before we actually went live. So hopefully uh, some people hung on. And, uh, yeah, that's it. You guys ready but, to listen? What? But we're trying something new with the video portion of our of our show, which is having who's actually speaking in the lower third of uh, yeah. of our screen. So if you're checking out the video portion of the show, you can see this uh, new thing that we're trying out. And uh, that would be Brad Ludwig. Brad has his name underneath the, uh, the main title of this podcast. And then there's Anessa Moyens. I think it's Moy. It's M, two zeros, a Y... Two threes and S. That's how she she's being all fancy. She's, she's elite hacks Oreo. <laughs> Word. Oh you. Okay. <laughs> before we the hand, before we uh, travel down the rabbit hole, let's get it started. In the news. And I know that you're sick, Anessa, but uh, I'm not going to give this story to anybody else because you gave this to me to prep. <laughs> And this was really hard to break down into bullet points, so... I, yeah, that's punishment, and I should never be given the, the task of searching for something when I've got NyQuil and stuff in my system. <laughs> um, so, this first story is about science. Yes. Science! <laughs> and, um, so a couple of guys, Vladimir Shcherbakov and, um... <laughs> Maxim Makukov <laughs> uh, hypothesized that there is 
an intelligent signal embedded in our DNA, like it's written in our genetic code. And they believe that we would have a better chance of deciphering this code and finding out more about our makers um, than actually getting a signal from uh, SETI, like using radio signals. So the odds of actually receiving a signal from outer space from another intelligence is less likely than figuring out our genetic code and finding this little stamp like designed by aliens in the Andromeda galaxy or wherever they came from, who knows. So yes, that there's a, a greater greater being. <laughs> and and they and they think that they have found in the human genome a pattern that couldn't be made in nature. It's so precise and so specific, right? Well, because they hypothesize that an intelligence signal embedded in our genetic code would be a mathematical and semantic message that cannot be accounted for by Darwinian evolution. So they can't say, oh, it's a Darwin thing. It's all about evolution. It's there regardless of an animal or being's evolution. So it's, I guess, would be kind of like in the foundation of an animal or humans as a species and they're trying to um, find any patterns in the genetic code that would be highly st statistically significant and possess intelligent like features that are inconsistent with any natural known process so so it's kind of like okay I have a comparison remember in the movie contact when they were trying to figure out what the what the signal meant, right? Right. Mm -hmm. They had to find one thing, and I, the name escapes me. It's like the um, Brad. Help oh, me out here. I just, I just remember like the stupid sound at the beginning of the movie. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. But there was there's a certain name for that certain thing that helps you figure out like to like translate a, something, like the key. Like a pattern, a code. No, it's like a ah. Oh, Damn it, my stupid brain. Anyways, uh, so it's it, it it'd be something common throughout. Oh, like a Rosetta Stone, the, the key to yeah. the language. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, so <laughs> that would be something that would be common, not only in humans' g, g, uh, genes, but also other mammals on the Earth. Is that what you're saying, Anessa? Yeah. Yes, I believe so. Interesting. What I'm saying. <laughs> You're sick. Yeah. Um. But no, I I think so. And they um. It's actually a really long article, but they're they're saying you know like like you mentioned earlier they were looking at the code and they I guess kind of think that they might have found something, but I don't know that they actually have. And so their logical conclusion to this would be that. It's from outer space. It's from a greater being than than us. So they kind of went from, oh, hey, there's this base or the potential for finding a set pattern, or as Brad put it, like a Rosetta Stone, um, to, oh, it must be from outer space. It's not anything that would naturally occur. So I don't know about their thought process, and I don't think that I could really follow along with their paper. Um, but if Brad were to say something and people were, would be watching the screen. Well, I'll put it up here. They could see the. Um, the I was uh, just waiting for an opportunity graph. to really kind of jump in, so people could take a look at this graphic, and what it, uh, mm -hmm. it. This is essentially what the information looks like that they've managed to uh, to decode. I'm kind of wondering if uh, I know the Human Genome Project was uh, the Human Genome. They finished that up, I think, two years ago. Something like that, where they actually just kind of broke down the entire code of of the human genome, and I wonder if maybe you know with that information, if they can dig into this a little bit further and see if they can find what they're looking for. But it kind of makes sense, you know. If I mean, we um, when we make, if you and I were to, or we as a human species were to make something and put it somewhere else, wouldn't you put an ID tag on it, in it, somewhere, in case you lost it? 
<laughs> so yeah, somebody no. could return it to you? Yeah, totally. That totally makes sense, yeah. Brad. And, and 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 not just that, but you know, human beings or I'm sure other creatures. I think this is a common thing in the universe. People want to be known, right? They want to. They don't. You know, I'm trying to think of the right way of saying this, but you know, they want it. People want to put. People want to put their mark on things, right? Yeah. You know, you want credit for it. Yeah, <laughs> like, that's true. true. Want credit. It, like it gang- beats peeing on it. Yes. It's like gangs, you know. That's why they tag things, you know. <laughs> this is my territory, yo. Yeah. Step, Step off. off. So I want to talk about the aliens that would put something like this together because that's a lot of planning, you know. That's they're very patient. This is a very patient race to yeah. uh, to seed the universe with this genetic code, and that's how they're getting their message across. I mean, that's that's crazy, right? When you think about it. Right. Um. I guess they've got nothing else better to do. <laughs> Maybe they're just so advanced that nothing entertains them anymore. You know, it's like right. They're like, oh, let's make a new or you know, thinking about like some other like some mad scientists and stuff like that. It's. Maybe it's ego. Maybe that's the maybe the scientist's name encoded in there. Or maybe it's a grad student. <laughs> this is mine. Like, I made this. See, here's my name. <laughs> yeah, or maybe it's like a grad student in some far off galaxy and this is part of their research and they want to see what happens when they create. <laughs> yeah. So eventually they're gonna have to do their defense and whatnot. <laughs> I wonder if you got an A off that paper. I don't know. They just kind of like let it go. They dropped out. We did our own thing, and then eventually so you got this vast actually... universe, and you got this small group of jackasses over here. That's your thesis. <laughs> you suck. F. <laughs> I don't know. Like maybe it's like a psychological research thing. What do humans do when left to their own devices? <laughs> Kill each other. But, yeah, like they haven't actually deciphered the code, but they think that they found a pattern, and they think that that would logically mean some higher intelligence that work. Well, the word panspermia came up in this article. It did, and that uh, endorses the idea that the Earth was seeded by interstellar life. So, um, which means it doesn't necessarily mean that you've got some greater being coming around and seeding the galaxy with life. Um, it could just be maybe a comet had some bacteria on it and it passed by and not only did water basically end up on, on Earth somehow, maybe possibly by that, I don't know, um, but there might have been life with that or on a meteorite and something impacted at another another site that had bacteria on it, sent another piece flying that had the bacteria, flew through space, landed on Earth, and pop. Yeah, it's not like the engineers on Prometheus, you know. Yeah, it's not like, I'm going to go and seed life and kill myself. So and, and, and that's not uncommon at all. I was reading an article where there was a hunk of mercury found on Earth. Oh, yeah. So, so there are... Mars that's been yeah, found there's... on Earth, and... It's crazy yeah, to think about how that happens. Planets you know? and asteroids, it's just you have an object that hits them hard enough to send uh, debris fast enough to break away from their orbit, and it just comes over here. And if it's large enough, then it can survive falling through Earth's atmosphere. Otherwise, it just burns up, and you don't really know about it. But yeah, hmm. there are chunks of other places here on Earth within our solar system. Galactic um, spew just all over the. <laughs> I was trying to you need a really big towel for that, don't you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. All right, yeah. cool, interesting story. I like it. Um, thank you, Anessa. Thanks for uh, powering through the the sniffles and the cough. It's mainly the cough. <laughs> all right, we would like uh, to know what you think of that story and. The next things that we'll be talking about, leave us feedback. Our voicemail number is the following series of digits, 805-328-3966, 805-328-3966.
3966. You can use that number to text us as well. Or email galacticnetcasts at gmail.com. It's galacticnetcasts at gmail.com. And we thank you in advance, all right, even before you do it, because you're thinking about it now, aren't you? You're thinking about leaving us feedback. You want to say something to us. You want your name on the show. So we thank you in advance for uh, leaving us feedback. All right, so here we go. Cool story of the week. I think this is the best story of the week. One of them, at least. So I'm going to put Brad's uh, camera up. He's showing a picture of uh, Canadian astronaut Chris Hadfield, who pulled a April Fool's Day joke on Twitter. And I, I, I think it was not just Twitter. I think he was doing this on uh, other social networks as well. Over the course of seven hours on Monday, the ISS commander tweeted about what he first thought was space debris, but turned out to be an alien craft approaching the International Space Station. Uh, with each Twitter post, he included photos, each having a more clear picture of the alien craft than the one before. Hadfield concluded by saying the object appears to be coming closer to the station. I think it might be trying to board us. And then posted an image of himself with his hands out holding a little green alien. And if you're watching us on video, that is the image that's up on uh, the Hangout right now. That's cute. Is it adorable? Yeah. It's adorable. adorable. It's a, so it's an alien race that look animated. They look like cartoons. <laughs> I just like his, uh, I like Hatfield's face. I know, he's like, oh, I don't know Do you think that's, uh, he purposefully, pur purposefully uh, posed in that, and then they put, like, he... Oh, oh yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah. All right, okay. He's like, okay, I'm, I'm going to do this, and take the picture, and then they plopped it on there. You know, his son or somebody in his family does all of his, all of his tweeting for him. Apparently, like he doesn't have access to actual Twitter. Like people will forward it to. Like he sends it down to NASA, and then yeah. They... Um, I I know the way it originally worked, and I assume it's the same way. But the astronauts that are in space that tweet send it down to NASA, and then it gets posted from there. Yeah. So they don't have direct access to it. NASA must have a really good social media like manager because. He does a lot of posting. Chris Hadfield does a crap load of posting. Yep. I have yeah, a feeling they, they probably, yeah, they yeah, must they have, have a full department for just for. Yeah, because they have so public many relations. Twitter feeds for different astronauts and projects, and a lot of their projects, even like the Mars rover, they give it like a personality. Mm -hmm. um, when you had, oh, I forget what it was called, but basically the rockets that they sent crashing into the moon so that way they could take the spectrum of the dust that was kicked up to analyze its uh, the moon's contents. Um, like that had an entertaining personality and it was like, okay, here I go. And then, yep. so yeah, they, they do a really good job with trying to get people to interact through social media. And I think Mike Massimino was the first one to tweet on Twitter mm -hmm. from space. So... I think that really helped kick it off too. And Chris, Chris Hadfield, I think has really raised the bar. He's he does like he did that Q and A with with William Shatner from the International International Space Station. Um, he posts pictures all the time. He's he's gotten into conversations with other people on Twitter and other social networks. You know, I think okay. he's really, I think, making it cool. I think he, I think he, it's especially being a Canadian. That's even better, you know. So, <laughs> That's even better. I don't, because Canada is awesome. My girlfriend's from Canada. <laughs> oh, traitor! <laughs> traitor! Yeah, the, what, what, what else what is else interesting, is interesting too, too, just to, just kind, to kind, of kind of get back, back on, on track, track here, here is uh, if you take a look at the image that uh, that is up right now. If you're watching the video portion of this, uh, he had space grenades that he was talking about during his uh, during his prank. And he actually had these items. Now I don't know what what practical purpose they. I don't think this is. He might have whipped this together, or it might actually be something that they use on the space station for they some are, sort of purpose. They are something they already use. I read that part. 
but you know the average person doesn't know that so it's kind of like a neat little well these look like space grenades I'll just tell them that that's what we're gonna defend the space station with I just like his swashbuckler esque face that he's got there like haha we'll show those aliens <laughs> yeah, he's pretty awesome. he is cool he's cool as hell all right, so even in space, they have fun on April Fool's Day. What do you guys think of April Fool's Day? Do you guys enjoy everything that happens on the net, on the web, on April Fool's Day? I usually don't pay attention because it usually ends up being a lot of the same thing, like, oh, my God, I'm pregnant. Just kidding, April Fool's. See, now, that happened to me. One, uh, one of the... Um, uh, jo uh, one, one of the people that, that works at the station said, oh, and, and my girlfriend's pregnant. And I looked at him and I'm like, ha, 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 yeah, right. He's like, no, no, really. And he's like, and here's a photo, and he showed it to me, and I found myself, and I was like looking on his phone, and I'm looking at the phone and analyzing the picture and <laughs> zooming in, and I'm like, nah, now that date doesn't look right. He's like, uh, no, uh, well, here, listen to, here's the audio of the, the actual heartbeat. <laughs> <laughs> and then, but then it was like the nurse giving the date and the time, and and but then I'm like, you're in radio, you work with audio, so I just kind of let it go for a little bit, and he had more details, and and then he seemed kind of sad, <laughs> like he really wanted to share this information with me, and I'm like, okay, I know you personally, I know that you wouldn't, you know, actually be sad. There would have been a point before we would have gotten here that you would have went, ah, just screwing with you. And uh, yeah, we're done. Now you're too clever for me. No, he's uh, he and his girlfriend are actually gonna be having a baby. So <laughs> wow, that's... I, I think and, and then I, I felt like a jerk. Him, yeah, I, I honestly think that if I was gonna break the news about being pregnant, that I would wait till the day after, the day before April Fools, because a lot of people tend to do stuff like that. And you're like, ah, oh, whatever. Well, he had let other people know this wasn't like the day he was telling oh, okay. people it was like he and I hadn't sat down and actually <laughs> talked at all for for quite some time and he's like oh hey by the way since you're here and it just happened to be <laughs> April <laughs> Fool's Day well okay oh, April Fool's Day. Day can really can bite you in the ass e yeah. even further down yeah. the line because like, these stories stay up on the net why am I saying net I never say the internet these stories no, can stay up fine. on the, the internet for a long time. And I was going to tell you guys that we got to watch what stories we find <laughs> because, you know, it could be an April Fool's Day joke story, you know? Mm -hmm. All right, so there you go. Um, third and final story, and I think we'll, ha we'll have a lot to say about this one, Brad. Oh, man. This was all over the internet uh, the other day. David Tennant and Billy Piper will appear in the 50th anniversary special of Doctor Who. Yes! Number 10 and Rose are back. Uh, for those of you who don't know, Tennant was the 10th Doctor, and Piper played his on-screen companion, Rose Tyler, in the show. Now, I'm going to be interested to find out, because if you did watch the show, you know that Rose is at least at the end of her tenure was somewhere where it would be impossible to get her back right. out of. So this must be at some point during their travels, yes. I have I have a theory, and I could be wrong about this. But no. Um wasn't there a second didn't the doctor like split off or there was a non Time Lord version of the Tenth Doctor with Rose yeah, in that alternate universe. Ran off to go to the uh -huh. alternate universe. Yeah. So maybe it's those two, or no. maybe it's her and him. Nope. No? I don't, no. Mm -mm. Nope, <laughs> I have a feeling it's going to be something that happened. That they intersect in their timeline, and there's like, oh. like this paradox. Okay, yeah, yeah. yeah, that makes a lot more sense. Uh, yes, and they're uh, filming the show, which will also star John Hurt. John Hurt of... Um, uh, Hellboy, he was Dr. Broom, um, he was in Alien, yeah, as he's the uh, the guy whose chest exploded, and the alien was on the ship, so that's John Hurt. Uh, Tenant successor Matt Smith is also in the special, uh, says fans will not be disappointed by the show, which will air November 23rd. Uh, Smith says that the episode... Uh, 
uh, manages to pay uh, homage to everything and look forward. Hmm. The first episode of Doctor Who and an Earthly Child was broadcast November 23, 1963. So it'll be exactly 50 years. Now, is November 23rd of this year, this is that a Saturday or is that a different day of the week? That's a good question. I'm flipping ahead here. November 23rd is a Saturday. Wow, they got lucky. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> really lucky. That worked out very well. Um, now, yeah, that's right. Da uh, David Tennant posted a picture of himself and Matt Smith taken after the initial read-through uh, of the script for the 50th anniversary episode. And if you look very closely on the picture, and I'm, uh, I don't think that we'll be able to see it necessarily... Um, on the image that, that I have here. Um, yeah, I don't think we'll be able to. Um, the uh, the name on the script is Blue Amend. I zoomed in really close uh, uh, to an image uh, earlier. Um, and uh, Moffat's very fond of anagrams. Oh, really? No. I wouldn't have. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I was listening to uh, the Nerdist podcast because I like to, you know, keep up on other pop culture geeky things. And uh, Jenna Louise Coleman did an interview with Chris Hardwick, and the anagram for, um, or the code for her, was, um, or the episode that she was supposed to be reading for was, or the show was Men on Waves. Okay, what does that mean? It was an anagram for Woman 7. Ooh. <laughs> Interesting. Um, yeah, so, and she mentioned that anagrams show up. I mean, like, Torchwood is an anagram for Doctor Who. Yep. Uh, Moffat is very, very keen on, on anagrams. So I'm kind of wondering if Blue Amend, is either Blue Amend or Blue Amends, um, is an anagram for the name of the show or... Something else. That, have you that tried to the put, episode. Have you tried to, pay, to put the letters in different order to figure out another word? Yeah, I have, and uh, I haven't really seen anything that's jumped out and said, you know, to me and said, "Oh, that sounds like the name of a Doctor Who episode." Because it would be a relatively short title, uh, two or three words. Um, so yeah, I'm kind of. I, I definitely want to play around with some more anagram programs and see if I can figure out what the title's going to be. <laughs> so uh, I was thinking about this last night. I gave this much thought. Um, I was thinking, could they potentially get the other doctors from earlier in the franchise to come on the 50th anniversary? And you know what? It would be, It would almost be hard because they're a lot older, right? Because David Tennant was the Doctor only a few years ago, so he still looks like the Doctor. If yeah. You, if you get like um, uh, Davidson, what's his first name? Um, Peter, Peter, Peter Davidson. Yeah. Or, uh, is that right? No. No, it's not Peter Davidson. It's, um, no, I'm, I'm mixing up Peter David, who is a writer for Marvel Comics. <laughs> but they're all much older. They're all... They're, they're, they're up there in age. They don't look like their characters from back in the day. So it, it would be harder to include them in a 50th anniversary, you know? You could get... Um, no, it was Peter Davidson. Okay. You Hello? could get Tenet, and you could get... Um, you can still include nine. them. Maybe have Eccleston would rather be stabbed, yeah. set on fire, and put out with a, a sandbag yeah, than did. ever do anything with the BBC or Doctor Who again. Yeah, you're right. But yeah, with with the other doctors though, they can maybe have them as cameos. Well, you know that um, if I can't remember what it was, it was a, a special that came. Um, it was part of a children's special. It was, yeah, it was it was one of the uh, I can't remember what their the, the charity is called, but they always do it every Christmas. Oh, the, the Red Nose charity. No, it wasn't Red Nose. It was uh, children for oh, shoot. And it was Tennant, and it was Peter Davidson. Peter yep. Davidson came back as the doctor, and they were and, in the TARDIS. And, you know, he he looked older, um, and seeing, like, current pictures of, of Tom Baker, Tom Baker looks very old now. Yep. Um, I, I really, you'd be very hard-pressed to, uh, even Paul McGann, 
uh, they just they're they're too old. I mean, even if you age more than at like four four years, five years, even looking at Matt Smith from when he started to what he looks like now, he has aged. Um, not much, but you can tell in his face he's getting more lines on his face, and that's you know probably from the long hours. Well, yeah, they, uh, Jenna Louise Coleman was saying that you know you're you're working twelve hours a day nonstop all the time, and that just really wears you down. I'm also looking forward to the biopic about Doctor Who. Yeah, a, t- a place in time and space or something. Is that what it's called? Something. Uh, uh, in the article, let's, this is link that we have the links for. And by the way, on a side note, we will have all the links to the stories in the show notes of the podcast. Yep, yep. Um, yeah, I'm trying to find it here. I did. I know I read it. Yeah, it's uh, um, an adventure in space and time. Yeah. So yeah, pretty cool. What did you guys think of? Oh, my God. God. Uh, David Bradley, the guy who was um, he was the groundskeeper in the Harry Potter movies. He's going to be playing William Hartnell. Oh, cool. Uh, I can't remember his name. He was in uh, Hot Fuzz, too, as the, uh, as the, uh, as the uh, farmer that with the shotgun yeah. that had the uh, sea mine <laughs> in his barn. Oh, God, that's such a hot house. This is a great movie. But anyways. What did you guys think of, on a side note, what did you guys think of The Bells of St. John? Excellent. When you find out what The Bells of St. John are, I, like, smack my head going, well, of course that's what it was. What was I thinking? And I really loved Matt Smith in this episode. I think he did a wonderful job. The phone is different. I don't want to. Uh, I'm gonna give something away here, but already giving something away. But well, if people are true Doctor Who fans, they would have seen it by now. You mean the, um, phone, that, the phone that the Doctor call used to call back to present day? Well, that he got called on yeah. by present day. Um, that phone has been used before, and it looked different. Well, it changes with the TARDIS, and the TARDIS changes, you know. Like, but like dramatically different, like entirely different time periods of phone. Well, I, I guess yeah, you can. I, I like what they did with the cord too. The cord was like impossibly long. <laughs> he's wandering around, and he's got it wrapped around himself, and then part of a tree, and it's just like it's completely yeah. ridiculous at that point. I like. Is it a demon? No, it's a I woman. Was gonna, I was going to mention that. Scene. <laughs> It was just, you know, that guy who from that time period was just like, I don't know, I don't know what I'm trying to say. It was, it was just so surreal having that scene, having him on the phone in that time period. It was just odd, you know. It was just off. It was, and one of the lines during that conversation, I'm like, oh, I know how, how they got the phone number. Yeah. It like hit me right, right in the face. Uh, I, I like, oh, they're already, they're already bringing that person back in. I'm gonna have to rewatch the episode. I was watching it with my family, and I wasn't quite, I wasn't concentrated enough. I'm gonna have to pay attention, watch it again. I was gonna, I was gonna, gonna say, say when, when yeah. Doctor Who's on, people need to just shut the hell up. <laughs> That's why I live alone. <laughs> <laughs> but you know what? I was what? really happy that I was able to watch it like in my apartment even though I was still kind of miserable. But um, yeah, because sometimes I'll go over to my friend's house to watch it. And um, Doctor Who, he's usually pretty quiet, but sometimes he'll say something like right when something's being said. And I'm like, ah, hit the rewind uh, button, go back. Uh, yeah, I'll make people rewind it because I'll be damned if I'm going to miss something. <laughs> It's the same thing for The Walking Dead. I'm I'm sitting there and watching it, and then James is like, "Oh, well, why didn't this person blah blah blah?" blah. And I'm like, Shh. <laughs> "They're actually talking in the scene." I, I have a friend whose son he's 12, and God bless him. I I love him like a nephew. He's a great great kid. But we'll be watching something, and and it's like a really good movie, 
and he'll inevitably ask a question that's answered like three minutes from that point in the film, and I'll look at him and I'll go, Harry, shh, just stop, listen, pay attention. When you get to the end of the film, if your questions haven't been answered, then we can go through it. But yeah. things are revealed, and you need to just yeah. take a deep breath and just be patient and listen. I've always, I know he's a kid, but I've always hated people that do that. I've had friends that have done that. Like, we'd go to the movies and watch a movie, and they'll, like, lean over and ask me a question. And I'm like, I don't know. I've never seen this before. That's why we're here. Just watch the movie and find <laughs> out. It's gonna, you're going to find out eventually. We'll talk about it afterwards. Yeah. Shut, Shut up. up. All right. Let's move <laughs> anyway. on. Let's move on. Um, all right. That's your news. Uh, we want to thank Audible.com for their support of the uh, Alien Invasion podcast and the Galactic Netcast Nest ne Network. Uh, for our listeners, Audible is offering a free audiobook download with a free 30-day trial to give you the opportunity to check out their service to coincide with the theme of this podcast. And speaking of the 10th Doctor, our pick this week on Audible is Doctor Who, The Stone Rose. You guys want to hear the synopsis, the plot synopsis? Absolutely. All right, so, so Mickey, that was uh, Rose's boyfriend for a, a while, um, is startled to find a statue of Rose in a museum, a statue that is 2,000 years old. Uh, the doctor realizes that this means the TARDIS will shortly take them to ancient Rome, but when it does, he and Rose soon have more on their minds than sculpture. While the doctor searches for a missing boy, Rose befriends a girl who claims to know the future, a girl whose predictions are surprisingly accurate, but then the doctor stumbles on the hideous truth behind the statue of Rose. And Rose herself learns that you have to be very careful what you wish for. Featuring the doctor and Rose as played by David Tennant and Billy Piper. They are the voices on this book. So uh, nice. that makes it even better. So check it out. That's our Audible pick for the week. You can pick that or any other one for your free trial. Go to Galactic Net or go to uh, audibletrial.com slash Galactic Netcasts and enter that promo code Galactic. No, wait a second. That's the uh, that's Stitcher. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we, we don't have a pro. We just go to audible.com slash Galactic Netcasts for your free audiobook, and we thank them for their support of the Alien Invasion podcast. All right, creature feature, and we have a sound thing that, right? Yes. Don't we? <laughs> <laughs> yes. All right, here it is. And now it's time for creature feature. <laughs> <laughs> and staying on the subject of Doctor, Doctor Who, I like to do themes. And I thought you guys would enjoy the Doctor Who theme, right? You guys... Absolutely. Absolutely. Big fans of that? Okay. So um, the creature feature this week is the Great Intelligence. He was uh, he made an appearance most recently in uh, the uh, the Snowman, right? The episode uh, from 2012, and yes. the Bells of Saint John. Yes. yes. But he originates from uh, a 1967 serial, The Abominable Snowman. The Web of Fear that aired in 1968 as well, and I doing my research, he was mentioned numerous times. Didn't make an appearance, but he got mentioned throughout uh, the run of the original Doctor Who from the 1960s to the 1980s. So the Great Intelligence is a disembodied sentient being who attempted to find a body in physical existence in the universe before. Now he originally had a body that had a mass of tentacles and mouths and was known as yog sothoth Yogg-Sothoth, Yogg -Sothoth, which is a creature actually in Cthulhu mythos. You know what? I was going to ask you about that because what tipped me off was the universe before now. That's what that's, That seemed very... Um, that sounds like... Uh, What's the what? H.P. Lovecraft, Cthulhu. Okay, Cthulhu. Yeah. Okay. It sounded. It had that feel to it. So I thought maybe that was Cthulhu. Um, 
The intelligence has the power to exert influence over human minds, and when not using a living being, it maintains a basic manis manis uh, manifestation. Manifestation. I've I've been having a hard time talking recently, and I'm a on-air DJ person, so that could be a problem. Um, as a three-sided pyramid of control spheres or an ivory pyramid. So uh, that's your creature feature. What do you guys think of the great intelligence uh, from, from your limited uh, exposure to them? I'm really hoping that they do a lot more explaining um, of the great intelligence in the upcoming episodes because I don't feel like they've really talked a whole lot about him. Like, he's kind of made an appearance in the last episode. Well, whatever, the snowman episode. Yeah. And the big snow globe thing, so. And he, and he was on the Bells of St. John, too. That was that was the great yeah. intelligence, yeah. right? Yes. Yes, yes it exactly. was. And he had actually assumed the visage of a previous cohort that the great intelligence had. Now I'm thinking that he's going to be a, a, a the theme for this for this half a season, right? Oh, absolutely. Yep. And I'm also thinking that maybe they're going to. I've I've seen the news. I've seen you know news stories about what they're bringing back as far as uh, nemeses for the Doctor this half season, like the Cybermen, right? Yep. And some other creatures they haven't had on the show since like the 1960s. So I'm the thinking, warriors. yeah, a lot of this stuff is going to be homages to the to the uh, to the series back in the day, right? Yes, absolutely. So looking forward to it, and yeah, I, I agree with you. And I saw, I hope that they explain him a little bit better because they just were like, "Hey, it's the great intelligence." <laughs> they didn't really. <laughs> That's about all we know. It's like, yeah. okay, he's the bad guy. Got yeah. it. Because most people, without doing their research, wouldn't know who yeah. he is or what he, what he's all about. If they just started with the newer episodes of Doctor Who from like 2005 onwards, then they're not really going to have as much of an idea of what the Great Intelligence is as the people that actually watched the older versions of Doctor Who and actually heard more about the Great Intelligence. So, so do you right think now it's kind of a do you think the Jenna Louise Coleman character has something to do or is, is tied into the Great Intelligence since he's been on, well, two out of the three episodes that she's been on? I'm going to guess so because they like to keep a theme. If you noticed with, um, well, at, at least with Amy, she was there for the crack in, in the wall, and that was a general theme throughout her entire run was the yep. crack that was following her through space and time and was devouring, I guess, other people. And then early on, I mean, even in the, in the first se season of the reboot, the um, Bad Wolf, that was and a And then Bad Wolf was for Rose, yeah. And yep. um, Doc some... Donna or something. I, 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 Donna didn't have, I don't think she had as much of a theme as Rose and Amy, but... Um, at some point, they were saying Dr. Donna, and they just, just assumed that it was the doctor and Donna, mm -hmm. which later became Donna was the doctor for a bit. Mm -hmm. um, oh, I forgot about that. Yeah. yeah. So they've all kind of had a theme, and so, yeah, I would say that Jenna Louise's theme is going to Martha be... Martha didn't have a theme. No. Martha was just busy pining over the doctor more than the others. <laughs> She it was really <laughs> sad. Yeah, she did have a thing for him, didn't she? <laughs> I, I mean, like, because Rose, she left with the doctor and she treated her boyfriend like crap. But Martha was just like, I love the doctor, but he doesn't see me like that. When I'm going to do this in every other episode. It just got old. I liked Martha a lot. I thought she was kick-ass. <laughs> I think she was a, a great character that didn't... And see, that was the thing. Like, they kept trying to make her seem like a badass, and I would just see her whining about the doctor, how he doesn't love her the same way that she loves him. Well, you can be a bad you can be a badass and still like be like hokey and and sad. Yeah, like you can you can be a badass and be hokey, but I didn't think she was that badass. 
Didn't she join UNIT? Yeah, but she was like, she was a doctor who ended up getting a physics degree that ended up like becoming a part of UNIT. It's like, what the is going on here? And then she went and did her rogue thing with Mickey. Yeah. So I don't, I don't know. All right, so that's your creature feature. You guys want to say anything more about them, or the? Do you have anything to expand on the great intelligence before we? I'm just it, looking forward to increasing my intelligence about the great intelligence through the upcoming episodes. There you go. If it'll you want to really, really, go ahead, Brad. It'll be really interesting to see how they take the great intelligence and if you've read anything about what's upcoming in Doctor Who, we know that. We know that River is coming back for one episode. I did not know that. Yes. River is coming back for one episode. <clears throat> and it seems like... I think we're going to see references to River also in, in the rest of the episodes. Okay. If I were... Were I a betting man, I okay. would put money on that. All right. So you can read a lot more about the Great Intelligence... Uh, at the links that we'll post in the uh, show notes of the podcast, because there's there's a crap load of information. I mean, I couldn't wrap my head around it all. Like they they detail every little reference to the Great Intelligence throughout the entire series, and every little like there's a lot more power that he has. Like he can make humans do a lot of different weird things. So uh, check out the links in the show notes of the podcast to learn more. About the great intelligence. Maybe. Hey, Dave. Hey, Brad. Uh, did you know that Stitcher has got apps? And they've also got an extension. They've got an app for, uh, for Google Chrome mm -hmm. that you can actually, in your browser, listen to the Stitcher. And also in Firefox, they've got an extension that you can click and go to Stitcher and listen to your favorite radio or your favorite podcast and or online radio stations. So we can add to the list because we normally say, you know, for your your smartphone, you know, your Android phone, your your iPhone, your Blackberry, your Android tablets, Nook, we can add that it also has browser extensions. In browser capabilities, absolutely. And uh, I've been listening to uh, some of our older shows and uh, listening to the Nerdist and other shows that, that interest me. Uh, through my Google Chrome browser. That's cool. I love Chrome. Big fan of Chrome. Yeah, huge Vanessa, Chrome fan. And Esther, do you use Chrome? Do you use Chrome? Um, no, I do not. I briefly used it. Um, actually, I did use it there for a while, and I liked it. But then when we were on Spreecast, I had a lot of issues. And okay. so I switched back to Firefox, which I'm not really a fan of. And then at work, I used Firefox because... I don't like the way Chrome works with the system that I have to use all the time. So well, the, what Brad just said, you can you can get the. I can use Firefox. Yeah, Firefox, kick ass. So, so yep. So uh, yeah, like we were talking, you know, uh, this is <laughs> this is basically a commercial, but Brad got us into it very easily. Thank you, Brad. That was <laughs> that was very professional. I messed it up, didn't I? Yeah. A little bit, yeah. I just, I'm having one of those nights. I'm having brain fart nights. I tried to lobby the softball and you went, That's exactly how I was when I did play softball in, in school. People really need to watch the video. <laughs> what? Brad was waving his oh, arms yeah. around. <laughs> the, yeah, there's, there's a lot of reasons to watch the video, that's for sure. Uh, but you can try uh, Stitcher. Put it on your smartphone or your tablet by going to stitcher.com slash galactic netcast. Enter the promo code galactic netcast. Again, that's stitcher.com slash galactic netcasts and enter the promo code galactic netcast. You can listen to all of our shows, Alien Invasion, Time Traveling Robots in Space, Sci-Fi Film School, which we are having a new episode of next week, and... Yes! yes. The, the latest latest addition to the Galactic Netcast Network, Closer Encounters with myself and my girlfriend, Stephanie. Um, so check them out. You can get all of those on the uh, Stitcher. On the Stitcher there. Hey. I did listen to uh, the episode of, uh, your first episode of Closer Encounters. What did you think? I liked it. Yeah? 
It's a, a good a good spin on on the sci-fi and relationships within sci-fi. Yeah, I it's like fun. it. It was fun. Uh, Stephanie is definitely a uh, natural. She was good. All right, let's move on to picks. Uh, let's start with Brad. What do you got? Well, I uh, decided to dig into a little bit of not the 50s, but the 60s. And uh, as I was flipping through Netflix, I, I noticed that there was a, a movie that I hadn't seen yet uh, from the Godzilla franchise, and it is Ghidorah. The Three-Headed Monster from 1964. Um, <laughs> the brief synopsis, uh, after a meteorite uh, unleashes a three-headed beast upon Tokyo, Mothra tries to unite Godzilla and Rodan to battle the extraterrestrial threat. Dun, dun, dun. So... Uh, for, for those of you who have actually watched the Godzilla film, <clears throat> you know that Godzilla just basically shows up and just stomps all over Tokyo, rolls around a bit, and then they find a way to make him kind of wander off again. Or he gets bored. Either of the two. Um, but this time, uh, Godzilla uh, <laughs> uh, ends up fighting Rodan. And Rodan's like a giant, almost a pterodactyl-type creature. Um who just his big thing is flying and then his wings can whip up like hurricane style winds. Um, and uh, so the two of them end up in in Tokyo, uh, in Japan, and they're beating the crap out of each other. And all they want to do is beat the crap out of each other, it would seem. And uh, of course, the people of Tokyo kind of get in the way. The thing about this and and if you watch any other Godzilla films is there's always threads of humanity you can't just tell the monster story you have to kind of weave the human elements into it and the human experience as defined by this big monster battle so you've got crazy coincidences or threads of people who are kind of supposed to be joined in in this story and as you watch it you're like okay they're supposed to talk to them and then they're gonna help them and so on and so forth so our individual threads for these different characters is a Himalayan princess whose life is threatened by people that want to take over uh, her kingdom and she is uh, overtaken by a Martian intelligence <laughs> There is a young female cub reporter who is looking to get the story of a lifetime and actually be uh, respected <laughs> as a reporter. Again, this is the 60s, so it's like, oh, you just need a man and all this kind of stuff. It's very kind of creepy. Um, there is a, uh, a cop who is the brother of the cub reporter uh, who was assigned to protect the princess, uh, but now he has to find her because she has mysteriously disappeared. And then there's a geologist who looks for uh, and finds uh, one of the, these meteorites that have uh, struck the Earth during a, uh, during a meteor shower. So you've got all these different characters who the geologist is actually <clears throat> an old friend and or could be love interest for the cub reporter. Uh, like I said, the cop is the brother of the cub reporter. And the Himalayan princess and the... Uh, who comes to Tokyo to, uh, she's supposed to give some kind of speech or something or visit as a dignitary, is supposed to be protected by this cop, but her plane explodes. But she's saved by uh, a voice with the, that's, a, that's like a big ball of light. The great intelligence. Something like that. Uh, you find out that Martians were actually... Uh, uh, they thrived on Mars, and uh, Ghidorah is the one that destroyed Mars, and uh, some of the Martians were able to escape as, as beings of energy and light to the Earth. Okay. Yeah. yeah. It was like they, they, put in a, they put in the Himalayan princess for some strange reason, and the only way to work her into the plot is to have magical light Martian being absorb into her body. And bring her. It just it's it was ridiculous. It was really no purpose to. You could have removed the Himalayan princess and actually beefed up the rest of the characters. It was really kind of pointless. 
You know what? You know what? Uh, Godzilla movies remind remind me of of the Transformer movies, because the story is really not about the Transformers themselves. It's about the people, the humans. You know what I mean? Yeah. So I mean, if you look at um, like comic books from from the Golden Age, you had the inclusion of Robin, who was a, a gateway for kids to kind of identify with Batman. You had Speedy, who was the sidekick of uh, Green Arrow, who was the, the gateway for the kids to to kind of attach themselves to the Green Arrow. You had all these different sidekicks. Um, you had, uh, who was it? Uh, Starman and Stri- Skyman and Stripesy. Stripesy? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Stripesy. That's the worst name ever. Uh yeah, it, it really was. Um, but anyways, um, so you had all these different ways to try to attach or humanize or, or kind of find a gateway to get you to be invested in the story, and that's really what, what the human characters are in, in Godzilla films. Um, and another interesting thing about this film is the inclusion of fairies. Mothra is a, is a caterpillar, in one of the previous movies, Mothra, it, the old Mothra is killed, and there's a caterpillar version of, of Mothra now. And uh, it's on Infant Island, where these fairies live and take care of the young Mothra. Oh, my God. It's just really kind of way out there. And after sniffing all of the uh, solvents and the carpet glue that they put in our office today, it was a very, very trippy movie to watch, let me tell you. Like, oh, look, twin fairy girls that are very tiny and they're oh, talking to them and they're going to help Mothra. Just, you know, it was just, it was out there, man. It was way out there. <laughs> so, anyways, uh, to make a long story shorter, um, it was, eh, if you like a Godzilla film, you like to watch people in rubber costumes step all over small wooden houses and stuff, uh, you know, good film. Um, and uh, Madara gets the team together, and and they they fight Ghidorah, and uh, there you go. It ended way too quick. the The character development was crap, and uh, the monsters are guys in rubber suits. The end. <laughs> Good review, Brad. Thank you. And if you like Brad's review and you're interested in the movie, we'll have it in the Pix page or on the Pix page through the Pix portal. Please, at galacticnetcast.com. Don't, 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 don't beg, Dave. It's all right. I was, just trying to, I was trying to find a word, another P word. Pix portal page. P, oh, no. Uh, pre- we present. Presenting the Pix, presenting portal, the Pix page. portal page. <laughs> proper. <laughs> the proper Pix portal page. <laughs> Peter Piper picked a pick up, pick up, pick up, pick up, pick up. Uh, so, yeah, go to galacticnetcast.com, sl- uh, click on uh, picks, and um, if you, if you want to buy it, if you want to buy the DVD, we will have the link up there, and uh, that helps you. God, what's wrong with me tonight? With your purchase, you can help support the Galactic Netcast Network because we get a small, little small percentage of uh, your purchase. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, Dave. It's probably my fault. My 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 state of mind, kind of being ooh, has rubbed off on you tonight. You know what? I am very <laughs> susceptible to like other energies from people, so that's quite possible. That's my quite nice possible. My face has ventured all the way to Iowa. No, it's I. That's how I am. I'm a sponge for like. A, stop it, Brad. You can be out. Freaking me out. All right, let's move on to Anessa. What do you got? Over, for- overly attached boyfriend. All right. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so my pick isn't so much a pick as it is a public service announcement to not watch this movie. <laughs> um. <laughs> and we wait. Uh oh. And we wait. I think she might be stuck. Anessa, Anessa is frozen in time. 
She's actually praying for release from watching this horrible frickin' nightmare of a movie. Seriously, after I got done watching it, I'm like, you know, it was like getting stabbed in the cerebral cortex with a bowling pin. It was just frickin' awful. Awful so, film. So why don't you start explaining it, and then by the time Anessa gets back, maybe she can... Imagine taking all the good parts of Blair Witch and and Cloverfield, right? right. Mm -hmm. Horribly ripping out the good parts, setting them on fire, and then peeing on them to put them out, and take all the bad parts and then make a film. That's what Invasion was. It was just it was all done from. Uh, it's like somebody took a GoPro camera. With a GoPro, it's like a high-def camera that you can uh, yep. mount on a bike, or if you're a skydiver, you can mount it on your helmet, whatever. It's like a very portable, high-quality digital camera. And what they did is they put it on the front of a car, and the whole concept of the film is it's taking place, all the video and the audio that you're getting is from a police car. I've seen this film. I've seen this movie. It's bad. It is bad. Oh. Right. And um, small town in California, meteors are dropping all over uh, that particular area, and she oh, me. Vanessa just sent a message. Onward to Dave's pick. <laughs> Tell you what, why don't we pause here? Okay. And we'll let Anessa give her perspective because we watched it at the same time. Okay, so I will do my pick. Um, yes. And we'll come back to Anessa. Uh, my pick is, hey, she's back. Oh, she is she's back. back. Yeah. There you are. Maybe. Nope, you're back. You just need to fire up your preset. Oh, I suppose I could do that. Okay, while you do that, I will I, I'll move on to my pick and then we'll we'll come back to you and Essa. So Is it necessary that I have the thing at the bottom of the screen? This you know, late in the game? Did well, you not save your preset? I did. Just go to toolbox. Click the, click the green plus sign at the bottom. Yeah. There you go. I don't have the logo, apparently. And you don't have... You don't have Alien Invasion, either. No. All right, well, Dave, apparently you talk, and then Anessa will straight right. straight. I'll just not worry about that. Yeah, don't worry about it. We're... Yeah, okay. Like, we're uh, almost done. They've seen who I am throughout most of the video. <laughs> if they haven't paid attention to this point, they need to be kicked in the shin. <laughs> All right, so my pick is Doctor Who... Spearhead from Space, and I watched this on Netflix. They have Doctor Who Classics now on Netflix. Um, they probably have about seven or eight serials going from uh, the late 1960s into the 1970s and 80s, I believe. It's a good, it's a good cross, cross section of uh, all the Doctors from uh, early on. So uh, this... This is the first serial of the seventh season in the British science fiction TV series, Doctor Who, um, which was first broadcast in four weekly parts from January 3rd to January 24th, 1970. It, this is uh, a first for a couple of things. It was the first to be produced in color. The serial introduced John Pertwee as the third Doctor. It also introduces Carolyn John as the Doctor's new assistant, Liz Shaw. Uh, let's see, Nicholas Courtney reprises his role as Brigadier Alistair, Alistair Lethbridge-Stewart, and becomes a regular cast member uh, beginning with this serial. It is, um, he's the commander of UNIT. Um, so here's the brief synopsis of the, uh, the serial, the episodes that I watched. Um, exiled to Earth in the late 20th century and forbidden to continue traveling by his own uh, by his own people, the Time Lords, the newly regenerated Doctor arrives in Oxley Woods, accompanied by a shower of mysterious meteorites. Investigating these unusual occurrences is the newly formed United Nations Intelligence Task Force. We just saw them in uh, the Bells of St. John. They're so they're still around. 
Uh, led by Brigadier Alistair Gordon Lethbridge Stewart. I love his name. <laughs> Units are soon called into action when people and meteorites start going missing. Most puzzling of all is the attempted kidnapping of a strange hospital patient, a man with two hearts, who insists he knows the brigadier. Of course, we're talking about uh, the doctor. The new doctor soon joins forces with his old friend, Unit, and the recently uh, recruited Dr. Elizabeth, Elizabeth Shaw. But time is running out. Irregular things are happening at a nearby plastics factory, which faceless creatures lurk in the woods. The Nestatines, or the, the Nestines, have arrived and want to conquer the Earth. And, of course, we saw the Nestines in the episode Rose, uh, the first of the uh, rebooted, or uh, the first of the new Doctor Who episodes in 2005. Um, so, yeah, that's my pick. Check it out. Uh, it's the Doctor Spearhead from Space. I love, uh, I love 1960s Doctor Who's, uh, or early Doctor Who's. They're all very cheaply made, and the, the camera angles are not that flattering. People are always sweaty for some reason. <laughs> yes. I would have loved to have worked on the set of old school Doctor Who because it just feels like they decided to look around and be like, okay, what do we have laying around? What can we do with it? Yep. How can we make this work? And they went to it, and I think that would have been a lot of fun. Even if the pay was crap, it would have been a lot of fun and totally worth it. Yeah, <laughs> and that's really, I mean, they were, I mean, they were cranking, cranking out episodes, episodes, and they had zero budget practically. Yeah. Um, so, you know, it's really mean, interesting if you watch like like the ninth, the Chris Eccleston stuff, the ninth Doctor stuff, seeing them use CG, but having it still look somewhat cheesy, just as kind of a nice tip of the hat to what's happened in the past. I mean, now that. You're not seeing that nearly as much now. Now it's very much high end. Every episode is like a, a movie, sort of a feel to it. Um, but that was kind of one of the really pleasing things about the the Eccleston run is just that whole tip of the hat to what the quality of the aliens and, and just that whole flying by the seat of your pants and whipping up an alien to, to you know to get the show going. I really don't think it was that much of a tip of a hat. I think it was. I don't think the quality and the budget was there yet, because it was just a brand new series, right? It was just it was it came back yeah, yeah. as a new series. So no, I think, that's right, because I think Christopher Eccleston even said that, and one of the reasons why he didn't want to come back is there was always that feeling that it was going to close shop tomorrow, mm -hmm. that the BBC wasn't really behind it. But you know, once he did a great job, and then once Tenet Tenet really took it over. Um, yeah. He's yes. kind of the Tom Baker uh, for the current generation of, of Doctor Who fans. Yeah, if you if you watch them in succession, you'll see the quality get better and better, especially when they start shooting in HD. Then it starts looking really, really nice, you know? Yeah. yeah. All right, that's my pick. Check it out, Doctor Who. Um, I did have a few other notes here, but that's okay. It's just little details that... Oh, you know what? Um, it was it's interesting. Um, this doctor, what's his name again? Uh, John Pertwee. John Pertwee. He his adventures were all on the Earth. He was stuck on the Earth because the Time Lords banished him to Earth. Right? Yeah, it's uh, the end of um, uh, Patrick Troughton's run. He had to. He did something to. I can't remember what what the name of the episode or what he did, but I just remember that he did something to stop an alien something from happening, and it was kind of nasty. Um, and the Time Lords went, you know, <laughs> we'll let you live, um, but we're going we're gonna to stick you on Earth, and you're just going to be stuck. Mm -hmm. When did when did he get that sentence lifted? Was it was it with John Pertwee or Yes, it was. It was, it was John, John Pertwee and it was the episode The Three Doctors. Okay. It was the last time that uh, William Hartnell <clears throat> what played the doctor. Um it was very it was towards the end of his life actually and it was uh Hartnell, Troughton and uh Pertwee all working together and at the end 
uh, selfless act. They save the universe and and the time lords, and uh, they lift. Uh, they give them the, the the memories and the dematerialization codes. Yeah, that was the one thing that I all, I I had written down here as a note is they there is a uh, they have codes. <laughs> they have de how do you say that word? Dematerialization codes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was never that was never really talked about or revealed until this episode. I thought that was kind of interesting. Yeah, I watched the three doctors. Um, I think only part of it though, and as I recall. Um, Hartnell was on a computer screen, right? He was never with them. No. Was, yeah. By that point, as I recall reading some material, his his cognitive abilities had kind of slipped a bit, and he was having a hard time memorizing lines, and they kept it as simple as possible by just having him kind of come in and out through a basically a, a glitch. You know, he could be seen on on the TARDIS. Now we're losing Brad. You there, Brad? I'm still here. Yeah, I'm here. Okay. No, I just stopped moving. Okay. <laughs> I All, right. Sorry. Sorry. All right, that's my pick. Uh, Anessa, do you want to pick it up where you left off? And we're not getting any audio from you. Check your microphone. What about now? There you go. Yes. Okay. So, yeah, sorry, I had it on mute because I randomly cough, and it's just easier that way. I hate random coughs. <laughs> That's in the world. Um, so, yeah, this this pick isn't so much a pick as it is a public service announcement to not watch this movie. Um, found it on Netflix. It didn't sound too bad initially when I read the description, but... Yeah, um, Netflix has it listed at an hour and 21 minutes in length. What they don't tell you is the movie is an hour long, and there's about 21 minutes of credits. <laughs> uh oh. It's called Vision, and um, apparently it's also known as Infection, and basically it's about um, this county in California. I guess Lawton County, and um, these meteorites fall to Earth, and this farmer, or not farmer, I forget what he is, but anyway, he's out in the country, I think he fishes, and he comes across it, and he calls in, um, like, hey, I found this thing, but as he's calling it in, he ends up getting attacked, and so they send the sheriff or the deputy sheriff out there to check things out, and... It basically turns out to be these meteorites that have this parasite that um, basically attacks humans and invades them as hosts, and it spreads through the ear, and it's trying to take over this county and then probably take over the world is its thing. Um, but the whole thing is shot on a, a camera that's mounted on a dash, so you have to think like a cop car with a dash cam. And to me, that was like the Lazy Man's um, Blair Witch Project. <laughs> that was it. That was like the only camera angle was the dash cam. And so you have whoever is driving the vehicle give the narrative of what's going on because they're calling in to the station and they're like, oh, this is what's happening. And occasionally you have people shamble on screen or off screen and whatnot. And um, yeah, it was... It was awful, and um, <laughs> Brad watched it with me, and I felt really bad about how awful it is. Um, but yeah, now, definitely the best boyfriend ever for watching that with me. <laughs> when, okay, was there? I forget. I, I've seen this movie too. I forget. <laughs> Was there multiple cars or just one car with one dash cam? It was one car with one dash cam the whole way through. I mean, you came across cars that were broken down on the side of the road or blocking the, the road so the person couldn't get out. But it was just the one dash cam. And I didn't really understand the picture-in-picture -picture feature of the dash cam because the sheriff or whoever was back at the station, you just saw like their chin down. I'm like, what's the point of having a camera if you can't see your face? 
<laughs> so it didn't really make any sense. Um, <laughs> and I really love Brad's description of what it was like to watch the movie. Yeah, let's hear that, Brad. What, how did... <laughs> it was like I said before, it was like getting stabbed in the cerebral cortex with a bowling pin repeatedly. It just... There might have been a high... There's, there's a certain point where... Um, the the next character who gets a hold of the car is like completely freaking out and rightly so. I mean, she just has witnessed people vomiting parasites into other people's ears, um, and they're 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 blocking their their retreat from this particular area. Um, and she's like completely freaking out, and then she, and then the character's like, "I'm dead. I can see myself coming down the road." And and you can you can see like these weird sort of ghost images of this character coming down the road. And we're like, "Where does this come from?" You know, it, and and I didn't ask any questions. Like 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 the little boy Harry. I waited until the end, and there was still the only thing that I could think of is the solution used at the end to get rid of the invasion is what caused damage to the camera and maybe, you know, or to, to the fabric of reality. I, I don't know. It, it was yeah, just it didn't so really make any sense. far-fetched <laughs> um, and ridiculous. <laughs> uh, occasionally there are flashes where all of everything just turns into a negative image and people can see this. So it's not just the camera malfunctioning, it's um, you know the character it's implied starts that it's screaming. like the flashing of like the meteorites crashing is what's that's what I got from it. But like, it like immediately like turns yeah, everything negative and it's into just like negative. There, there's no establishing yeah. shot that or like a, a trail or something to describe why this is happening. For all you know, it's an alien beam weapon. And you have no idea what's going on. And it just uh, <laughs> and 20 <laughs> minutes worth of credits maybe for a film that had Brad Pitt in it. But this <laughs> steaming crap fest did not warrant 20 minutes of goddamn credits, well, I'll tell you that. The, the credits were 20 minutes long because it would be, like, written by so-and-so. And then it's, like, the next page, directed by so-and-so. It was, like, one title per page for 20 minutes. <laughs> well, they had to give it to movie length, right? They didn't want to... They movie. could have made it as a documentary or something if they really wanted it to be short and justified. But or no, expanded it just... on you know they have like a, a, a sort of a, a the introduction of found footage sort of thing. That yeah. But even but, that at the very end of the film completely negates the whole damn thing. Who found it? There was nobody left to find it. It didn't make any sense that there would be anything left to found, find unless somehow it was being transmitted back to the station. But even then, the implication would be that there's nothing left to find anything. The, the, the so, solution was fairly final. Uh. Yeah. I'm like, it just, yeah, There's. it makes no sense that there would be a found footage if there's nothing left to find. Do you think the star of this movie was the car? <laughs> <laughs> the no, because the car didn't it have a credit. Road. So no, <laughs> the car didn't have a credit. I'm I'm gonna say the dirt road. <laughs> uh, but it was like the person driving back and forth the same like stretch. Like they'd come across a bridge. They can't cross it because it's damaged. They go, they go back. They're blocked it, in because it's like a like shitty alien. version of our town. <laughs> really, just one set piece. It's the road, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. It's like my God. At that point, I wanted to get jump through the TV screen so I could go through the bridge that you're not supposed to cross because you're gonna die. I had crossed it. Oh, <laughs> you know I'd have taken my chances. You know this movie had no budget, right? I mean, they're using one yeah, yeah, because they spent it all on but credits. <laughs> Jackasses. <laughs> they paid by the page for credits. That's what happened. The production company completely built them for three quarters of their budget because they had to, had a per page <laughs> fee for the credits. Oh. Do you think we've spent too much time on a shitty movie? <laughs> And he's not holding it against me. So. No, I, I no, think not. I win. 
I, well, I don't think either of you really knew what you were getting into. <laughs> no, no, I had no idea. <laughs> Next no, time, I, I will go on to Patent Tomato, and if something says that 29% of people liked it, then I'm just going to pass it right on by, because there's a pretty good reason why. But I didn't see that been, until after the fact. This could have been a great sci-fi film school movie to watch. <laughs> oh that yeah, that's you know, me. and I was thinking that I'm like, oh, this is a steaming crap fest that would be great for the sci-fi film school. <laughs> but Matt would never do the show ever again. No, like we no. would never see Matt. And the next time I went to Wisconsin, I'm pretty sure he would seek me out <laughs> <laughs> and kill you. <laughs> Moines, I'm coming for you. <laughs> All right, that's going to do it pretty much for this. Uh, we've gone pretty long this episode, so we should probably wrap it up. Yeah, we should. Uh, it's the Alien Invasion, and uh, we'd like you to subscribe to this podcast. You can either subscribe to the individual Alien Invasion podcast uh, feed or the mega feed, which will get you this podcast. It will get you the Sci-Fi Film School. It will get you Closer Encounters, and it will get you Time Traveling Robots in Space once that comes back. So the mega feed is what we're really pushing right now, but you can subscribe to The Alien Invasion. That's fine, too. Uh, go to sub subscribe.galacticnetcast.com. I didn't mean to sound like uh, like I was pissy there. That's not, That wasn't my intention. Sorry. What? No, we, we spent way too much time on all that garbage. Are you kidding me? No. <laughs> We spent about as much. You're time. running the show. I would have kicked our asses by now. But right. yeah, God, we're just done. This this movie's crap. Okay, next. It was fun. It was fun to watch you guys vent. It was very entertaining. <laughs> oh. It was more tenor, more entertaining than the movie, probably. <laughs> All right. Uh, we also would like you to follow us on our various social networks: uh, Facebook, Twitter, Google Plus. Just search for Galactic Netcast, and you should be able to find us. And uh, write a review for us on uh, iTunes. We'd appreciate it, appreciate that as well. So, as we always do, as we always end the show, final thoughts. Let's start with Brad Ludwig. Uh, for the love of all that's holy, don't watch Invasion, a.k.a. Infection. If you see it on Netflix, you just walk on by. <laughs> Keep walking. Keep walking. Keep, Keep browsing. Walking. Keep browsing. Nothing to see here. Anessa, final thought. Her uh -oh. final, her final thought up. is nothing. Her final thought is contemplation. <laughs> she's, 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 she's embarrassed a, by the movie. <laughs> she, no, she really, really wants a good final thought. So she's thinking. She's really thinking. Yeah. See, look at her. Look at She's... She's serious. It's a serious look on her face. All right. We'll we'll maybe Yeah, well we won't try to bring her back. We'll just we'll just say that's that's it for this uh edition of the Alien Invasion. Until next time, we'll talk to you later, Brad. Good night, Dave. See ya. <laughs>